Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this uh, inaugural meeting of the Budget Committee. Uh, the uh, uh, first order of business is to see if there's any regrets, but Madam Clerk, I see the entire committee is here and most of Council as well. So hello, everybody. Are there any declarations of pecuniary interest on the part of the uh, members of the committee? Madam Clerk, I don't see any. We have no consent items on this agenda. Our first discussion item is the election of the 2023 Budget Committee Chair. Members, is there a nominee? Councillor O'Meara. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. I'd like to move uh, Councillor Hazlitt Deal. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. I'd like to move Councillor, or nominate Councillor Hazlitt Thiel. Thank you. Um, are there any other nominations? Seeing none, uh, Councillor Hazlitt Thiel, uh, I think you've been appointed. Congratulations. Uh, I'm going to pass to you the, uh, the little agenda guideline that I have, unless you have a copy. And you just pick up here at the top of the page. Enjoy, it's fun, and there's nothing to it. Well, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for the nomination, Sean. Um, I want to just begin by thanking Councillor Adams for eight years of successfully chairing the committee, um, and we look forward to your guidance and support. As past chair, we know that you will always make a great contribution to the committee's uh, due diligence, so I appreciate that. Um, so I, I understand that we have uh, CAO Closey that is going to provide an overview, um, follow, followed by the Director of Finance and, and Treasury. Um, I would like to say that we, we appreciate all the hard work that staff have put in to date. We know that you have a lot of details to cover, um, and in particular, we probably have a lot of questions about those details, so together I'm sure we will get to a great spot. Um, so without further ado, we have work to do, and uh, we look forward to the presentations. Uh, good morning, um, Chair Hassett Thiel, the Budget Committee. I am the Budget Committee. <clears throat> I'm, uh, oh, actually, we are pleased to present the 2023 budget to you today. Back in August, Council had given us direction, um, and at that time you recognized the impact of inflation, of keeping a budget in line with inflation on our business and residence communities. At that time, inflation was running at a rate of 8.34%, uh, which was quite high. I understand today it's down at 63 which is an improvement. Um, staff were requested to prepare a budget um, that presented reduction options so that you had some ability to look at a budget at a rate less than inflation. We are pleased today to present you a budget that is actually less than inflation, and John will certainly outline the details of that in his presentation. <clears throat> the budget, as Councillor Hassett Thiel had said, um, is a result of a tremendous amount of work by staff. Uh, who have brought you this budget in what is really a climate of great uncertainty. Uh, uncertainty is probably the best word to describe the climate that we're in right now in terms of moving forward, not only in the preparation of this budget, but over the, the next year, I think we'll have some good challenges to, uh, to uh, uh, work through. The last two budgets managed through the pandemic, and while the country um, continues to recover, and we hope that a return to business as usual happens soon, the reality is that business is far from normal at this point in time. We continue to deal with a series of challenges uh, that include persistent inflation, higher construction costs, which you'll see as part of the budget presentation. The cost increase not only challenged the reasonableness of continuing with some of the planned projects, uh, but it makes our budget projections extremely difficult in bringing you this budget today. We also continue to mitigate the pandemic uh, related revenue impacts. We're managing an ongoing supply chain challenges, which uh, create impacts in terms of the delivery of the program. Well, we have to address and anticipate labor market impacts in this budget and work through significant legislative changes, and in particular, Bill 23, uh, which, as you'll see in John's presentation, has not been reflected in this budget, as our budget was prepared before this legislation had come out. But Bill 23 will create some challenges, if unmitigated, um, as not as much this year, but certainly in 2024 and the years beyond. All of these factors have contributed to 
a rather uncertain climate in the preparation of the budget. However, there's always got to be a, a shining light somewhere. <laughs> we are seeing some wonderful signs of, uh, of returning to a thriving community in Oakville. Our recreation and cultural centers are booming. Uh, community events are resuming. The outdoor space use res remains high as it was in the pandemic and is continuing. Our transit continues to improve its ridership and we continue to grow as a community. On the administration side, we are focused on service transfer transformation, diversity and inclusion, resiliency, climate action, uh, and our people to ensure that our operational long-term goals are able to be met in the long term, creating that foundation for ongoing improvements to our residents and businesses. Also in 2023, we'll work with you as council on a new strategic plan that will outline your key priorities, not only over your term, next term at council, but well beyond into uh, hopefully looking at the next three decades. Despite this uncertainty, there is much to look forward to and we remain confident in our financial position and staff has successfully developed a budget that is under the projected rate of inflation as I had indicated earlier. Uh, and we have not presented to you reduction options. That is an option that's always open to council but with bringing in the budget less than inflation, uh, we have not prepared, prepared those for you ahead of time. Uh, bringing it under, under, un, in under inflation gives you some flexibility if there are some other programs that you would like to add to the budget. So I am very proud of the staff and, and the work that they have done in pulling together this budget in rather a very uncertain year. And I will now pass over the presentation. John will give you a very detailed presentation of the budget itself. And over the next week, you'll see presentations from each of the commissioners in terms of the specifics in each of those commissions. So, John. Thank you, Jane. And I'll wait till that presentation is up. There we go. So good morning, members of Budget Committee and members of Council. I'm excited to be here today to talk about the 2023 budget uh, for the Town of Oakville. So I have a little agenda here to organize the various budget topics that we'll be going through this morning. And you'll see this slide come up uh, numerous times as we go through each topic. And we're going to start with the budget process. And just we're going to start with a reminder of some of the key parts of the budget process that we follow here at the town. So up here on the screen right now is a high level timeline that we use for preparing the annual budget. You'll notice that it's a little bit different from the typical process that we use given that 2022 was an election year. Having said that, most of the process is quite similar to what we've used in the past. The budget kicks off in early summer. As finance, we meet with the departments to talk about their budgets, their work plans, and their upcoming projects. This year, in early August, we also took an update report to Council to advise Council and the public about the 2023 budget process and touch on some key inflation concerns. Throughout the summer, departments work on preparing their budgets, and then finance reviews them in late summer. We put everything together and present the operating budget along with any new requests to the executive leadership team. We also go over the capital projects, including any new projects that are added either to the current year or to the forecast. Once the executive leadership team approves the operating and capital budgets, the next step is to bring the budget together in one book and prepare the various presentations that you'll see next week. Then you as budget committee have the opportunity to review, ask questions, make changes, and ultimately approve the budget to bring to council in February. So that was the high level process, but there are a few key dates that I'd like to touch on for a moment as well. So first up is today, January 17th. Today is the big day where we release the budget book for the 2023 operating and capital budgets, along with the 10 year capital forecast. The only presentation that we have today is this overview presentation. However, next week on the 24th and on the 26th, we will have each of the commissioners and the CAO's office present their program budgets with specific accomplishments from the past year and objectives for the year and years to come. The agenda for these days will also include any staff reports for the various budget referrals that have been made over the course of the past year. During the week of February 13, members of the public will have two opportunities to delegate to Budget Committee to share any thoughts, questions, or requests that they may have. One of these sessions is on Valentine's Day at 9.30 in the morning, and the other is on February 16th at 6.30 in the evening. Don't worry, we didn't make the Valentine's one in the evening, so. 
Uh, on February 21st, the Budget Committee will have the opportunity to deliberate and approve the budget before we get to final Council approval on February 27th. So before I leave this slide, I do want to point out that in the past, the Budget Chair has often held a Budget Open House, where members of the public can ask any budget-related questions that they may have. And should Chair Hazlitt Thiel be interested in doing so, finance staff would be willing to help you with that. All right, now that we've talked about timelines, it's also important to talk about the process of building the budget and the principles that guide our approach. So in building the budget each year, there are a number of different factors that we need to consider as finance and as an organization. I've listed a number of the key ones here on this slide and I'll touch on them each briefly. So the first one is council's strategic priorities. As you well know, council sets various strategic priorities to guide and shape the organization. And these have an impact on how, where, and when we spend our funds. As the current council has just begun their term together and has not yet completed a, a strategic plan, we've used the previous council strategic plan in building the 2023 budget. Once a new strategic plan has been completed, this will then help to guide future year's budgets. The next item is council's direction. And this refers to the direction on tax impacts, on tax impacts by council to keep the overall increase to inflation. And I'll touch on that more in a moment. PB2 methodology, so the town uses PB2 methodology, which is performance-based, program-based budgeting. This means that we focus on programs rather than departments, and we have an emphasis on the allocation of resources based on desired outcomes, and the measurement of program results um, against those desired outcomes. In a couple of slides, you'll see how we match our programs with council st strategic priorities. Our fourth bullet is service levels. We build our budget around maintaining service and service levels that are valued by our residents. From time to time, this necessitates changes to various programs which can have a budgetary impact. The town's sound financial position. The town's finances have been well managed and as a result, we are in a sound financial position. Our capital and stabilization reserves both exceed the recommended levels from the Government Finance Officers Association and the town's debt levels are within both the provincial and internal limits. As we evaluate capital budget considerations, it's important to consider the impact that these projects will have on reserve and debt levels and allow us to maintain our strong financial position. Included as a staff report for today's meeting is a comprehensive summary of the town's various reserves. I won't go into more detail on that report in this presentation, as the report provides a good overview of the reserves and reserve funds and the various purposes or reasons that we have those funds. And as we always have, staff will continue to report on our reserve balances in each quarterly variance report. Next, we have infrastructure and asset management. So infrastructure is a critical element of the town and its ability to, to deliver services that residents need and rely upon. The town has $3.6 billion worth of infrastructure under its control, and it is very important that we take good care of that. The town has established a corporate asset management plan and is continuing to build its asset management culture. Asset management and the corporate asset management team play a big role in helping us establish the budget. The team works with departments to evaluate capital and operating requests and needs, taking risks and whole life cycle cost perspectives to determine the best way to prioritize the various requests. They also do that keeping in mind our overall financial strategy to ensure that our reserves are stable. And finally, growth. As the town continues to grow, this has an impact on the town's budget. This impacts us on the capital side with new projects that need to be completed, and these are primarily funded by development charges. It also impacts us on the operating side, as we need to consider the operating impacts of these projects, and ideally match that with the growth that we are seeing on the assessment roll. And as you see on the slide before you, there is a reference to Bill 23, and I'd like to touch on that a little bit more. So as Jane mentioned, this budget was prepared before uh, Bill 23. Um, and so this budget does not include any Bill 23 impacts. Our budget was substantially complete and the impacts of both capital and operating are not yet known. So it was premature to adjust the 2023 budget for the impact of these legislative changes. In addition, many of the Bill 23 changes have impacts for the long term as opposed to for the current year's operating budget. Now, having said this, Bill 23 will have a number of financial impacts to the town. Our development charge revenues and parkland revenues are both forecasted to drop. 
The figures you see here are from the staff report that we brought to P&D Council in December. We've used ranges to quantify the long-term potential impacts due to uncertainties related to the determination of which land costs would be eligible or ineligible in our DC calculations, and due to uncertainties in the nature and timing of parkland calculations, as each parcel will have its own impact. In the absence of alternative funding from other levels of government, these reduced revenues will have an impact on both our growth and non-growth capital projects. Growth projects may either be delayed due to less funding, or the town may need to use its own reserves to pay for a portion of these projects. And then any use of the town's own reserves would therefore limit funding available for non-growth initiatives the town may want to consider. As these could be wide ranging impacts for our capital projects, we'll need to understand the full picture so we can react in a way that continues to ensure our sound financial position. On the operating side of things, Bill 23 may impact some of the town's property tax classes which will therefore shift the tax burden to other property tax classes. In addition, in the absence of any alternative funding the town may receive, the town may need to consider increases to property taxes to cover the unfunded costs of growth projects. Just like for our capital projects, there are uncertainties, and therefore we'll need to continue to review the current and future Bill 23 changes, assess the potential impacts, and then bring these back for Council's attention. All right, strategic priorities. So a few moments ago, I mentioned that strategic priorities set by Council are one of our key budget principles. As you can see here, these are the key areas of focus for Council arranged into five different groups or buckets, all connected with the town's vision to be the most livable town in Canada. As we move to the next slide, you'll see how we've grouped each of our programs under one of these key areas of focus to help connect the budget with Council's strategic priorities. And that's what you see here. These are the headings from the previous slide with the various programs listed underneath. And these groupings are similar to what they were last year. So hopefully that's uh, pretty familiar for Budget Committee and Council. And I will come back to this, uh, this structure in a couple of slides when I talk about how the budget spending is grouped by each key priority area. Council direction. So I mentioned earlier one of the key variables that we need to consider when we build the budget is Council's direction for any increases. And Council has directed staff to keep the overall property tax increase in line with inflation. And as Jane alluded to earlier, given the current economic environment, this proved to be quite difficult. Inflation has been quite high for some time now, peaking at over 8% in June of last year. On the screen, I've put the projected inflation rates from the Bank of Canada from their two most recent monetary policy reports. In August, when we took our budget direction report to Council, we, we included the rates from the July 2022 Monetary Policy Report, which forecasted a 2023 inflation rate of 4.6%. The most recent report from October 2022 is forecasting an overall increase of 4.1% for 2023. And I believe that their next Monetary Policy Report is actually scheduled to come next week on January 25th. So I included this information on the slide for a couple of reasons. For one, the 2022 inflation is far greater than what was considered when the 2022 budget was approved. As you've seen and heard in our quarterly variance reports, capital project budgets have been under significant pressure due to the rising costs of, of construction. Indicated by the non-residential construction price index, increasing by 29% over the last two years. These rising costs have proved challenging for our existing capital projects that are at the procurement stage, as supply chain and commodity volatility have had a major impact on pricing. The 2023 projected inflation is still sitting north of 4%, and that's something to keep in mind when you see the rates in our, future, in our rates in the next slides. I do want to add that the forecasted inflation for 2024 remains consistent in both Bank of Canada reports at 2.3%. This indicates that the Bank of Canada is confident that inflation will be returning to more reasonable rate in the coming years. And I hope that they're right. One final note on inflation. It is important to remember that the inflationary target we use applies to both our tax levy impact, but also to the rates and fees that we set for town programs. And I'll touch on that a little bit more in the presentation. All right, uh, the next item up is the town share of the tax bill. And that's another variable that we need to consider, especially as a lower tier municipality. The town share of the overall tax levy budget is about 42% with the region and the province making up the remainder. 
This means that any changes that they may have will have an impact on the overall tax levy increase, and this is something we need to consider. And with that, I'm going to switch gears a little bit from the budget process to actually talk about the 2023 operating budget. So I'll start with looking at the budget, the, the budget as an, uh, an overall before going into the operating section itself. So on the screen, you'll see $504.4 million, and that is the full amount of the investment that we are proposing to make next year in the town of Oakville for ongoing services and for capital projects. The operating budget is $347.6 million, and the capital budget is $156.8 million. As we move to the next slide, you'll see how this is broken down into the strategic priorities um, that have been identified by Council. So on a previous slide, we had looked at those key areas of focus that you now see listed across the top. Those are the same headings of livability, engaged community, accountable government, environment and climate change, and mobility. The numbers under each key area reflect the planned investments that the town is making in that category in this year's budget. And we do this for both the operating and capital investments. And then we also show the total investment by category as well as the tax levy impact. In the commissioner presentations next week, you'll hear much more about the many programs and initiatives under each key focus area. However, I'd like to take a moment to highlight a couple of key capital budget items in each area for you. Our investments in livability include funds for the design of fire station number nine in North Oakville and funds for the streetscape study for Kerr, Bronte and downtown Oakville. Engaged community, the largest item in this category is for the continued, uh, the continued construction of the 16 mile sports complex and library. Account accountable government, many of these investments are for the behind the scenes work that happens here at the town, but it also includes funding for the 2023 to 2026 council strategic plan. Under the environment key focus area are investments to address climate change, including the home energy retrofit program, as well as funds to support our tree canopy and the electrification of our transit fleet. And finally, our investments in mobility include funds for traffic calming and active transportation. So before I leave this slide, there are a couple of other reminders I'd like to share with you. One, and this is for the accountants in the room, this chart, at least the operating portion, it will not match the totals that I just showed you on the previous slide as we remove all the corporate items as they don't naturally fit in any of the categories. The second thing is that some projects actually fit in more than one category. A good example of this is the electrification of our transit fleet. Replacing diesel buses with electric buses addresses both the environment focus as well as mobility. And finally, this chart can be found on page 10 of the budget book. And the subsequent pages after that also break out some of the key initiatives in each key focus area. All right, talking now about the tax levy impact for this year's proposed budget. I'm gonna start with a high level summary of the impacts for our residents and taxpayers, and then move into some more details on the specific drivers for this year's budget. The total tax levy as proposed in this budget is 238.1 million. And this represents a nearly $16 million increase overall and a $12 million increase after adjusting for growth as compared to the figures from last year's budget. On a percentage increase for existing residents, the town share is a 5.43% increase. And as part of the entire tax bill after adding in the region education shares, this works out to 3.52% increase, which is in line with council's direction to keep the overall increase in line with inflation. It's also important to keep in mind that these figures you see before you are before any considerations that may come to budget committee over the coming weeks. All right, so this brings us to our key budget driver slide. And this chart can be found on page 16 of the budget book. And I do know that it has a lot of information on it. However, it does capture what the key drivers are for the changes in this year's operating budget. I'm gonna walk you through each factor and do my best to explain how each budget driver impacts the town's operating budget. Before I do that, it's important to note the columns across the top. The first column has the budget drivers. These are the things that impact the budget. I'm gonna skip the second column for a second and go to the third one. This column has the increase in actual dollars in millions. The fourth column has the percentage change on the town's tax levy, followed by the percentage change on the tax bill itself. The last column is what the impact means for $100,000 of assessment. And this is to help our residents gain an understanding of what this budget would mean to their property. 
At the bottom, you'll see how the second column splits out the town, region of Halton, and education portions of the tax bill. So now I'll go through each budget driver and talk about each one a little bit more. So first up, we have inflationary impacts. So this line reflects changes to the existing base that provide for the same level of service that we've had in the pre uh, previous year. The largest driver is for personnel increases for our labor contracts. And in addition, this is where we have the impact for the rising costs of materials, supplies, and services for our operations. Perhaps the most obvious example of this is the price of fuel, with the 2023 budget reflecting a $2.5 million increase for gas and diesel. This inflation line also includes the inflationary increases to our rates and fees. Overall, the inflationary impacts are significant this year, accounting for a 5.43% increase on the town share of the tax levy. Capital and growth. So this category captures the operating impacts of new growth and new capital projects. This is a routine driver that we have, though the amount depends on the nature of projects and of growth, and you'll see that in the next slide. So I'm going to take a little break from the budget driver chart and talk a little bit more about the capital and growth impact items. And you'll see that the $3.3 million on the bottom here matches the previous slide that we just saw. Each year as we go through the budget process, we also identify any increased costs related to growth or to bring new capital projects into operation. As you can see in the chart here of the 3.3 million in increases to the 2023 budget, most are related to the operating impacts of a variety of capital projects, including costs for the expansion of transits, electric specialized fleet, and maintenance for 16 mile sports complex sports fields. We also have increased contributions to the building maintenance reserve for Trafalgar Park Community Centre and Oakville Trafalgar Community Centre. The other two impacts are much smaller. One is for the operating and maintenance impacts of serving a growing community. The easiest way to think of this is the additional costs in our roads and works team to plow more roads and clear more sidewalks as we add additional roads and sidewalks from development. The other item is for maintaining service levels across the town. These are more indirect than adding new roads or parks and are generally for back office type services that increase over time. These types of requests are brought forward to the executive leadership team for consideration and approval as part of the budget process. So now I'll head back to that budget driver chart to talk about service enhancements. And this line reflects additional or increased levels of service in the town's programs. And so similar to the growth one, I have a separate chart to explain this number a little bit more. So the net impact of the uh, to the tax levy of the service enhancements is 360,000, though there are a number of different items that are included within here. The majority of the tax levy increase is for two additional positions in planning to address the impacts of Bill 109. I would also like to point out the bottom two rows of the chart where you'll see that there is no actual tax levy impact listed for these items as they are funded through fees and or reserves. We do list them here and in the budget book to show that they've been included in the overall budget. And I'd also like to point out the use of the tax stabilization reserve funding for a portion of the film office pilot. We do occasionally use our tax stabilization reserve for temporary or one-off items like pilot programs or for COVID impacts. And I'm gonna come back to that uh, COVID impacts um, in a couple of slides. All right, so heading back to our budget driver chart. The next row that we have is for prior year's assessment growth. And this is a line that we don't have every year. In 2017, the town started a practice to align our assessment growth recognized in the budget with the actual impacts of growth in an effort to avoid significant swings in our tax levy. What this means is that in years where the town has assessment growth in excess of what is required for funding the impacts of growth in that year, these unused funds are then transferred to our tax stabilization reserve until they are required. Likewise, in years where the operating costs of growth are higher, we can then use some of these funds to pay for those increased costs. Given the high growth impacts in the 2023 budget and the overall higher costs, we are using almost $2 million of these growth funds in the 2023 budget. Our next line is the capital levy. The town has a long-standing policy of taking 1% of the prior year's total tax levy amount and adding that to our capital envelope. This is a very valuable tool that allows us to finance the various capital projects that the town undertakes. 
This funding source becomes even more important as we continue to refine our asset management plan and look to our future infrastructure needs. All right, so now we're gonna move into some COVID impacts, which are these four rows of yellow on our chart. So the first item is the reversal of last year's COVID impacts. The budget for 2022 included over $5 million in COVID impacts. And to ensure that these increases do not become part of the base budget, they've been removed here. That's why they're listed as a negative. And this effectively resets the budget on the expense side, moving down one row. We also added revenue for government support for our COVID impacts last year to avoid adding these to our tax levy. So just like we removed the expenses, we also need to remove the revenues from the budget. So together, these two lines had a nil impact on the 2022 tax levy. And so removing them also has a net nil impact on the 2023 tax levy. Transit impact. So the only significant remaining COVID impact that we have included in this year's budget is for transit. Coming out of the pandemic, ridership and transit has not yet recovered to pre-pandemic levels. While it is our hope that over time this will happen, in the next couple of years, this reduced ridership will have a significant impact on our transit revenues as seen here for $3.2 million. Commissioner Fu will speak more to the long-term outlook for transit ridership in her presentation next week. Now, having talked about the impact of transit ridership, this brings us to the next line, and that is actually funding this impact. As I mentioned earlier, we do use tax stabilization for one-time items. As it is our expectation that transit ridership will recover, and so as not to burden our ratepayers with this temporary blip and lost transit fee revenues, we have included funding in the 2023 budget from tax stabilization reserve to offset these transit impacts. As transit re revenues recover and the impact is reduced, the funding will also be reduced accordingly. So before we move on to assessment growth, I do wanna point out that the total operating budget impact before growth is just under $16 million or 7.19%. This number is reduced, however, due to the assessment growth that we have added this, for this year. Assessment growth reflects the additional properties being added to the rule, which were not included in the prior year's budget. This is a regular budget driver, though the amount of growth does fluctuate. And this year's assessment growth is almost $4 million. So finally, our last budget driver is a row that we currently have blank, and it is for any items that the Budget Committee may want to consider adding to the 2023 budget. In a few slides, I'll show you some considerations from ELT and some other ones from council that have been referred throughout the past year. So that's the end of our budget drivers. So as it stands now, before any other adjustments, the overall tax increase to existing residents is 12.06 million or 5.43% of the town's tax levy. And when you add in the region and education shares, that's how we get to that 3.52% that I mentioned previously. Now, I thought I would show this in a couple of different ways to help you visualize what it means. So for one, we have a pyramid chart that's taken from page 15 of the budget book. And this shows at the bottom the program increase of 7.19%, which is the increase before we consider growth. After, after we add in that assessment growth, the town's increase to existing residents is 5.43%. And once we add in the regional and provincial amounts, the overall increase is at 3.52%. And finally, one other way to look at it, this is a way to visualize the operating budget as a breakdown of what $100 of taxes would be by major program area. And you can see, as you can see in this chart taken from page 13 of the budget book, infrastructure renewal has the largest share at almost 25%, followed by emergency services, Oakville Transit, and the road network. And this slide is very, very similar to what we had last year as well. Our, our, our share of $100 of taxes is very consistent. So before I move on to some additional considerations for the budget committee, I think it's important to point out that the town has always had a desire to look for opportunities and improvements in how we conduct our business. This can lead to efficiencies and better experiences for our residents. To help show this, the slide in front of you is a bit of a timeline of our recent history of doing this and where we find ourselves today. In 2017, the town engaged the services of a consulting firm to assist us in looking for opportunities in our various service lines. Staff then assess these opportunities and look for ways to address them and capture any budget impacts. 
The budgets in 2019 to 2021 included a number of these findings as staff went through the process of addressing and incorporating the opportunities. We have COVID in our timeline here as well, as it's important to highlight perhaps the silver lining of the pandemic. We needed to look at service transformations and process improvements as we handled the various pandemic impacts. And that leads us to now. With COVID behind us, we can continue with our recreation and facilities reviews for the upcoming years. And Commissioner Bell will speak more to that in her presentations. And we as a town will look ahead to the next areas of focus to improve our services to residents. So I mentioned a few minutes ago, some considerations for the budget committee. As we go through our budget process, requests are brought forward to our executive leadership team for them to consider. And in addition to the growth and service level initiatives I mentioned earlier, there are a few other considerations that are not currently in the operating budget. So these items are not currently included, but they are ones that the budget committee may want to consider. We've listed the five items here, along with their tax levy dollar and percentage impacts. And I'll touch on them quickly, and the commissioners will also touch on them in their presentations. So the first is for a new position in revenue and taxation for the upcoming vacant home tax program and to address ongoing pressures as the town grows and introduces new programs. The next three items are all for enhanced sidewalk clearing services in specific areas of town, and you can see those areas listed on the slide. The final item is for the town's recreation services to provide grants to assist organizations with community programs. And as I said, the commissioners will touch on these in more detail when they get to their presentations next week. So the final item on the operating budget that I would like to bring to your attention are the budget committee referrals. So throughout the year, several items have been referred to the budget committee from council and P and D meetings. And these are summarized on the slide here. I know they're in really small font, so I'll touch on each one of them briefly. So the first and the last item actually both relate to streetscaping in Kerr Village. And there will be a staff report coming next week, which addresses both of these items. Funds have been included in the budget for a study and Commissioner Garvey will speak more to this referral next week. The second item for a heritage tax rebate program has not been included in the budget. However, there is an accompanying staff report that will be looked at next week, as well as in Commissioner Garvey's presentation. The third item is a reference to the town's new community benefits charge or CBC. And it was included to ensure that the projects listed in our CBC strategy document are also included in the capital budget and forecast. And I can assure you that they have been. Finally, our fourth item is a reference to the downtown cultural hub, which is included as a program initiative in the 2023 capital budget. And again, Commissioner Garby will speak to this in his presentation. So make sure you tune into his presentation. All right, so that's the end of the operating budget. I do have one slide on our operating forecast as well. So while council is only approving the budget for 2023, it is important to look ahead to the future. So the chart you see before you, which is also on page 26 of our budget book, is similar to our 2023 budget driver chart, though there are a few differences. Across the top, this chart shows the forecasted impact on the town's tax levy and the tax bill itself. And we do this for both 2024 and 2025. So as you can see, the inflationary impacts are expected to be much lower than for 2023. And this is in keeping with the Bank of Canada's long-term expectations. As we continue to see what Canadian and global inflation patterns are, we'll keep council apprised of any changes to these rates. Another thing to point out here are the transit impacts I spoke of earlier. As ridership returns, it is our hope that the transit impact will be reduced and therefore the reliance on the tax stabilization funding can also be reduced. And at the bottom of the chart, you'll see that we've used 3% for the region of Halton and that was based on their most recent budget report. All right, so those are the end of my thoughts on the operating budget and forecast. So we're gonna switch gears now a little bit and talk about the capital budget. So the 2023 capital budget, while it's not as large as our 2022 capital budget, still has a number of key initiatives and projects that total to 156.8 million. And you can see the, the figure broken down here into the three categories that we use to organize the town's capital budget. I'll go through each of these captions here and touch on a couple of key items. However, more details will be available in the budget book and will be touched on by the commissioners in their presentations. So the first item is growth of almost $40 million. Of this, $8 million is for the Burloak grade separation. $7 million for the continued construction of the 16 mile sports complex and library. 
3.6 million for the North Service Road Urbanization and Widening, and just over $3 million for the 16 mile library collections. Oops, sorry. Can't forget about infrastructure renewal and program initiatives. So infrastructure renewal is listed at 80 million for this year's budget. 9 million of this is for our road resurfacing program. 8 million for our electric bus or electric replacement buses. 4 million for the parkade rehabilitation and 3.7 million for the York Street and Wallace Road reconstruction. And finally, our last category is for program initiatives. And these are strategic projects that are not related to growth or infrastructure renewal. This year's budget has $37.5 million in projects, including $12 million for Calcigate urbanization, $3 million for the master accommodation plan, and $2.1 million for the 16 mile sports complex geothermal retrofit. And that is a tongue twister to say. All right, to help visualize this a little bit more, this chart breaks out the program areas that have the largest capital spending. So I won't go into too much detail here as the commissioners will touch on this in their presentations, but I do think it provides a clear representation as to which programs areas have the bulk of our capital spending. And in a similar way, this slide focuses on where we get the funds to pay for those capital projects. And if you remember back to my presentation last year, we had a significant number of growth, growth related projects that were funded by DCs and by DC debt. As the 2023 capital budget is almost 50% for infrastructure renewal projects, it makes more sense to see our capital levy and our capital and equipment reserves as key funding sources. Development charges in the new CBC continue to provide a significant funding source for our growth projects though. All right, up next is our 10 year capital forecast, which lists all of our planned projects from 2023 all the way to 2032. So in a similar matter to the uh, similar way to the capital budget, I'll touch on a couple of the key highlights that is part of this $1.9 billion forecast. So the growth figure includes $1.1 billion and it includes funds for new parks and parkland acquisition, fire station number nine, future community centers and libraries, a new downtown parking facility, electric buses, and road and active transportation projects. Infrastructure renewal of 744 million includes money for electric bus and vehicle replacements, road resurfacing, various facilities, parks, road, bridge, and sidewalk rehabilitations, stormwater work, and various IT projects. And finally, program initiatives of $92 million includes funds for various corporate initiatives, including our EAB and invasive species control, the capital lease for our bus electrification equipment, and the downtown cultural hub refresh. So this is a similar slide to what we had for the 2023 capital budget as well by program, except now the figures are for the 10 year forecast. And it might be a little bit difficult to see, but I've also included some colors to represent the different types of projects, which areas have a heavy growth focus versus infrastructure renewal. And as we continue to refine our asset management plan, our financial strategies for these infrastructure items will become more robust. All right, so rates and fees, our last item on our agenda for today. Each year as part of the annual budget process, rates and fees are reviewed by departments to ensure they reflect the costs of delivering services. This is in keeping with the town's rates and fee policy. And as a reminder, whenever fees do not fully cover the cost of a program, that difference falls to our tax levy. The report that we brought to council in August of 2022 highlighted our plan to increase rates and fees with inflation and as a result, the proposed budget includes these increases at 4.6%. Included in today's agenda is a staff report, which includes more information and has an appendix outlining all the specific rates and fees. The fees are posted on the town website to allow the public time to review them. And as well, a notice was placed in the Oakville Beaver advertising today's meeting. The fees are included as part of the draft budget for budget committee deliberations and will ultimately be part of the budget approval by council. So that brings us to the end of the presentation for today. So as a reminder, the budget books are printed for members of council and I think most of you already have them. And if you don't, they will be in your mail slots here at town hall. And after the meeting, they will be uploaded to eScribe as well. And after today's meeting, we will also put a full copy of the budget book on the town's website. So the public is also able to review it. 
Before I thank some key staff, I did want to touch on Bill 23 one more time. While there remain uncertainties in both the legislation and in future regulations and alternative funding, it is our intention to keep Council and the public informed as best as we can. As we learn more and understand what it means in both the short-term and the long-term financial impacts, we will come back to you when we have this information. I would like to say thank you to a variety of people that have gone uh, that have done a lot of work in building this budget. First of all, to our departments for their submissions and their staff reports, and for working hard to submit budgets in a way that balances the inflation concerns we talked about earlier with their operational needs and serving our residents. I'd also like to thank our internal cross-departmental budget review committee that works through the various requests we receive through the budget process. I'd like to thank our executive leadership team for their guidance and support as we've gone through this process. And I'd like to thank my finance team as a whole, Dalibar Stankovici, Matt Day, and the rest of the entire team for all the hard work that they've done in preparing the budget for this year. Well, I have the privilege of standing before you today to share these thoughts on the 2023 budget. There's a whole team behind me that puts in a lot of hard work behind the scenes, and I'm very appreciative for their dedication and their commitment. And that brings us to the end of the presentation. Thank you very much for that comprehensive overview. Um, I turn to the committee now. Do we have questions? And um, I'm going to go to Councillor Elgar, then to Sean. Thank you. Through you, uh, uh, Councillor Haslett-Field, um, I'd like to thank staff for the high-level 30,000-foot presentation. And uh, I know there's a lot in this book. My big concern is the spitball that the province threw at us through Bill 23, uh, which came at the last minute and not in time for this budget. But when I start uh, digging into what I've been reading in the last few weeks, well, over the last month, basically, a lot of municipalities are saying, unless something happens to Bill 23 and it changes, this is going to be the gift that keeps on giving for years where we're going to have, and it ranges from different municipality to municipality, but it's, the range is 12 to 17% alone on annual tax increase unless th changes are made. Uh, it's a bit shocking, and I don't think the residents have any idea. When do you think we will have more data before February 27th when we will be approving this budget? To just to, so that, we, because if we can't do anything, we have to at least get the MPPs that they understand the impact that they are creating for each municipality. And, as, and I'm more concerned about Oakville and Halton right now, but it's across Ontario. Do you have any idea when you'll have more detailed information available? Uh, through you, uh, Chair Hazlitt Thiel. I wish I could answer that question and tell you when we'll have more detail. That would be very helpful to me and, and my team in planning for, for the budget. Um, I think one of the things that we can do best as town staff is to continue to report back when we have that information. I think we're planning to take a, a report back, I'm looking at Nancy here, in, in spring as we continue to learn more. Um, but unfortunately, I don't think we'll have anything by February 27th on that. So would that mean even though we approved the budget for 2023 and February 27th, and yet when we find out that we should have been increasing our budget uh, by a much higher percentage, or it'll have a double whammy in 2024, Will we then re, 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 uh, revisit our 2023 budget? Is that the, what might happen? Uh, well, I wouldn't, through you, Councillor uh, Hazlitt-Thiel, I don't think we would revisit the budget necessarily, but I do think that a lot of the impacts for Bill 23 are very long-term focused. And so I think we'll need to fully understand what it means and then strategize about how we're going to approach those items. And then we can bring back reports to outline more immediate items and then update our, our long-term forecast as we do every year with our 10-year capital forecast. That would probably be the best time. And I think, Commissioner Sully, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, no, through you, Chair Hazlitt, you know, That's that was what I was going to say as well. I don't think you're going to see, there may be, there will be some minor impacts in 23 with the phase-in of DC rates, et cetera, so we're managing that on a cash flow basis. As far as actually impacting the tax levy in 23, I think to John's point, it's longer term. We're going to see this over time as we see the revenue shortfalls on our parkland, et cetera. And then it's how do we manage that? What is the best option for the municipality and going forward? So there's a lot of, um, certainly we're waiting for those regulations to come out to give us more details. One of the big ones is land. The land, is it land under roads? What land is going to be exempt? Because that's going to be significant. 
And then how are we going to manage that going forward? So I, I don't see us um, op reopening the 2023 budget, but I do see us coming back as more information comes out on what those longer term impacts are and recommendations on how to, to manage those. Should we not be made whole through um, uh, the province as they have uh, indicated? Okay. Well, I thank you for that. I just, I just think that the more information we have, the better uh, we can do making decisions where we should maybe hold back capital projects going forward. To, and the reason we're doing it is so that the, you know, 12 to 17 percent. I don't think many people are going to be very happy to see that in, in future years either. On on an annual, it's not a one time. It's a gift that keeps on giving. So I thank you. Thank you, Councillor Elgar. Councillor O'Meara. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you, John, and everyone for, for the work you've done here. Not, not to get too far in the weeds on the first one, um, just um, can we get a copy of your presentation and the Commissioner's presentations prior to getting into the meeting? It's great to sort of follow along and, and, and do that. that would be helpful. Um, and just, I just had two questions in your presentation, uh, John, just about Bill 109 and the FTEs for the Planning Department. And then you, there was also a section on, uh, on a partial FTE for the vacant home tax credit. Are these not programs that would cover themselves with the, with the uh, um, I mean, planning, we, we, it's usually planners, we charge the people who need the planners and pay for the planners. But even with the vacant home tax program, would that not be something funding that comes out of that program or would we be, be funding that through the tax levy? Uh, through you, Chair Hazlitt-Thiel. Uh, so I think I can try to provide a couple answers to those questions. So um, for one on the planning positions, I believe it depends on the nature of those positions. Some of our planning positions are funded by our planning fees, but not all of them. I think our policy ones are not. Uh, Commissioner Garby can probably answer that better in his presentation um, when we get there. Uh, for the vacant home tax one, uh, similar answer. That program hasn't been fully launched yet. So it'll depend on what that program looks like, but there will be a lot of work that will go into building it uh, that we have to do ahead of time. And again, Commissioner Sally will touch on that more in her presentation as well. Okay, so there is, yeah, and again, I'll, I'll point to the commissioners at the time, but there is the possibility when we get these programs in place, they can sort of be self-sustaining then not having to rely on the tax levy, depending on how we're depending. using the, the staff, right? Yeah, perfect. Correct. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Councillor Adams. Thanks very much for the overview presentation. I have a couple of uh, questions. I wonder if staff could come back with uh, further information at the, the next meetings um, or um, wh whichever meeting it makes sense for. Uh, the first is uh, if staff could provide uh, opportunities for additional supports for community events. And I'm, I'm thinking um, of all the various events that we have around town. I know uh, Ward 7 certainly has one now, but there's been uh, one in Northeast Oakville that I think may be coming back this year after COVID. I know Oak Park has one, and so there's a number of them around town, uh, and, and I think they should all be given uh, equal opportunity and equal uh, granting opportunity. Uh, it may be the kind of thing that a, a pool of funding might be appropriate to, uh, for example, manage through the mayor's office uh, for community grants. Um, that's one thing. The, the second is we had a discussion about Bill 23 and the, the potential impacts. Could staff provide a, a list of growth projects that would that could be at risk uh, in some kind of prioritized way so that A, we can consider uh, which ones in the future might need to be pushed back uh, or dropped entirely. Uh, and that would allow us to understand ourselves what the impacts would be, but also to communicate to uh, residents and to the MPPs uh, what, the, what the possible risks are uh, to growth uh, should they continue with the the plan that they they are unrolling right now. Uh, so those are, are two of the items that I wanted to bring forward um, at this current time. I, I think there'll be some other ones later on. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Adams. I look around to my other council colleagues. I believe Councillor Hisgina has a question. Happened twice and it hasn't happened since. But I'm just wondering if anyone else 
I'm, I'm not sure that was not me talking. <laughs> Didn't sound like you, <laughs> Natalia. Um, thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Jonathan, for the presentation. Um, I guess the first point of clarification, you had mentioned about uh, Bill uh, 23 impact and you said that we may need to shift burden to other property tax classes. I, I, maybe I misheard that or could, could you just clarify what that means? Certainly through Chair Hazlitt Theo. One of the proposals in Bill 23 is to look at uh, the tax, um, how the tax classes are done for, I believe it's rental um, um, properties. And so any changes to one tax class then impact other tax classes based on the ratios. So that was just alluding to that. If there is a change at the provincial level and how that's done, it would impact what our residents would see on their tax bill. So unrelated to the growth side of things, more about the tax classes. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, next uh, quick question, and perhaps um, uh, Commissioner Fu might uh, be addressing it later, but regarding the transit impact, you had indicated about um, that, may, again, maybe I misheard it, but the 3.21 million is still COVID related issue. So we're gonna be using funds from uh, tax stabilization. Um, will we also be bringing forward this line item uh, to other levels of government uh, as well? Uh, perhaps after the budget, just to, uh, to indicate that this is still a COVID impact? Uh, through you, uh, Chair Hazeltiel, um, that's probably something Commissioner Fu can answer better than I can. So um, if you're okay waiting to her presentation. Yeah, no, nope, that's great, thank you. And one last uh, question you had mentioned, uh, I think it was the capital budget forecast, the geothermal retrofit mm -hmm. for 60 mile. Um, and that will include the, the business case regarding what, how many years it will take to recoup the energy savings and um, I mean, notwithstanding the, the environmental benefit, but then also for other um, community centers as well. Uh, through you, Chair Hazlitt, deal. So I don't have that information right in front of me, but I know that we do have staff on the energy side of things who would be taking a look at that as part of the business case for considering it. So we can certainly bring that information back to you along with the request from Councillor Adams. Thank you very much. Councillor Adams. Sorry, there were two, two more things that I thought I should add to this list of um, information requests. One is, Every single uh, budget has had a discussion about traffic calming initiatives. And I know there are, there's listings of uh, a number of projects within the book already, but when uh, the commissioners come forward next week with their commission presentations, could we make sure that there's a breakout of, the, um, uh, of all the traffic calming uh, work that's going on specifically, so it's all rolled up in one place? Um, and second, could we have a list of additional opportunities that we could undertake should we wish to? Because uh, I know that is a common uh, discussion that we, we have. Uh, and then on a separate piece, could we also have a listing of the active transportation projects? That's it, thanks. Looking for any other questions from other councillors? I do have a, a few that I will add then. Um, um, and thank you to my council colleagues for their, their great questions. Um, in terms of reserves, um, you referenced uh, that uh, the impact in terms of the cost of materials um, and just the inflation was driving um, significant increases. Can, can you come back and just speak to what, uh, what your recommendation is around protection of the staff? tax stabilization fund? In other words, what is, uh, w what's the target that we, you recommend we hold to? We have spent out of the tax stabilization fund mid-year previously and as we need to, but I'd like to understand what is the, what is the preferred target um, to, to maintain it? Um, and if you could also include in that um, maybe a description of what we pulled uh, from tax stabilization in 2022, so we can just maybe have an historical reference point. Certainly, uh, through to you, Chair Hazeltiel. Um, we can certainly uh, come back on the, uh, the second part of your question. I might be able to answer the first part of your question right now. Um, in the reserve report that we do have in today's, on today's agenda, uh, there is a chart on, it's page six of the staff report, 
And it has a little um, orange line that shows what our target is based off of the GFOA, Government Finance Officers Association, their best practice for your stabilization funding. And so that is the, you know, that is one of the key targets. It's obviously not the only one, but that's a, a good one to see where we are um, benchmarked on there. So hopefully that helps your first question. We'll come back to you on the second one. Thanks very much for that. Um, uh, in terms of details, I'm assuming that flood mitigation plans will come um, from Commissioner uh, Phoebe's uh, presentation. Is that correct? Um, Commissioner Fu, I think she's here. She can address that in her presentation. Yeah. Um, my other question is around um, just in terms of uh, framing information for the public. So some of the charts are doing a great job of showing us 23 um, and the line, is it possible to see the spend in 2022? Well, I know we get quarterly reports at a glance um, reflecting on what we did in 2022 versus what is now recommended um, may be helpful for some who are trying to uh, digest all of this. Uh, to you, Chair Hazlethiel, um, we can, can I'll, I'll try to think of something with our team to best show that. We are still going through a year-end process, um, and because most of the time the budget is done when we're still in the projection stage, uh, we don't normally have that, um, but uh, we'll put some minds on and see what we can come up with to help you on that. Thank you. And my other question is around assessment growth. So at the region, um, they had talked about what the assessment growth was and had planned for 1.7 and received communication that it was to be 1.4 um, and they had to pull from, or proposing to pull from reserves. Have we gotten confirmation uh, of what our assessment growth is and is that what is in this budget? Correct. The, the number that is listed in our budget uh, is, is from the information provided to us by MPAC. Okay. Thank you very much. So I think that's all for questions. I believe we need a motion to receive today's report. So, sorry, Madam Chair. Sorry, so, Councillor one, one last question. Just do, do we know where the province is with MPAC and with reassessment? Are we, I'm sorry to just trip you on the last minute there, but I'm, I'm very curious. I think it was 2020, it was delayed, and I've heard some movement happening over the past six months, but uh, any updates on that, on the reassessment process? Uh, through your chair, Hazlitt It's a question we've asked as well when we have the opportunity, and I don't have a better answer for you at this time. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Mayor Burton. I'll give you the motion. Okay, so we have a motion on the floor to receive what, the reports today. I don't believe I need a seconder in committee, so I'll call the vote of the committee members. All in favor? Okay, that passes. Thank you very much for all the due diligence that's been done to date. Um, I remind the public that we meet again on January 24th at 9.30 uh, to begin staff presentations to review the program budget, as well as on the 26th. Um, information will be up on the website, as was explained in the meeting today, um, and we look forward to the staff's presentation. Thanks very much, everyone, for your good work, and we will see you on the 24th.